In the 1990s, rapper Big L was a force to be reckoned with. Nas was scared by how good he was. Jay-Z was unable to beat him in a rap battle. And he's considered one of the greatest lyricists of that era. But with so much potential, Big L was shot dead in his own neighborhood, a murder which remains unsolved till this day. Big L grew up in the area of 139th Street and Lenox in Harlem, New York. Big L's brother, Don, claimed that it was a rough area at that time, but apparently their mother was involved in unlicensed gambling, and this gave them enough money to get by. In an interview with Complex, Don said, We were struggling just like everybody else, but my mom's was doing what she was doing in the street. She was running numbers. She was doing her thing. So we had a lot of nice things. A childhood friend named Jules claimed that Big L's older brother, Lee, was a feared person in the neighborhood. So Big L enjoyed a level of protection by virtue of being his younger brother. Jules said, Lee was the most notable scary guy amongst groups of scary guys. You know how your brother or your dad is your first superhero? So if everybody in the neighborhood is in awe of your big brother, you become in awe. You feel like you're part of the privileged class because this is my big brother, this is my house. In 1985, Don got two tickets to see Run DMC as part of their King of Rock tour. However, the friend he had asked to go with him bailed and he had nobody to go with. He would say, so I got back to the block and I really didn't want to go by myself. Lamont, Big L, was playing in the park as usual. I said, F it, you want to go to a concert? He said, yeah. He didn't even know who the hell it was. This chance decision proved to be a formidable moment in his younger brother's life. Don said, when they started, I'm the king of rock. There's no one higher. Everyone jumped up. I looked down and Lamont's like, mouth open, completely mesmerized. That was it. By age 12, Big L was freestyling in his neighborhood, and in a short span of time, he became incredibly good at it, to the extent that he wanted to get noticed. The producer, Lord Finesse, was doing an autograph signing at a record store on 125th Street. While signing records, Finesse was approached by a guy who said that his friend wanted to spit a few rhymes for him. Finesse was asked this every day, so he gave him his manager's number and told him to get his friend to rap for his manager. Big L was given Lord Finesse's manager's number, but rejected it. He said, tell Lord Finesse I'm going to rhyme for him now. And reluctantly, he agreed. Speaking on the People's Party podcast, Lord Finesse said, Then he rhymed for me. I've never heard a cat at that age, that polished, you know? Of course, it was a lot of things he needed to work on. But for the age had to be 16 or 17, he was sharp. I mean, when he finished rhyming for me, I was asking for his number. Finesse introduced Big L to a rap group known as Diggin' in the Crates Crew, which included Fat Joe and Diamond D. In 1993, Big L released one of his most famous tracks, Devil's Son. The song was one of, if not the first ever, horrorcore-styled hip-hop song. And because of lyrics like, I pistol whip my priest every Sunday, this song was banned from radio. When asked about this song, Big L said, I've always been a fan of horror flicks. Plus, the things I see in Harlem are very scary, so I just put it all together in a rhyme. And that same year, he signed to Columbia Records. But even by this time, Big L didn't even have a demo tape. So once again, he just rapped right in front of their A&R guy, Kurt Woodley, and got signed. So Crazy Tim and the street guy named I God, they kept saying, Kurt, I've got this kid. He's off the hook, man. They brought him up and he was real young at the time. I was like, this kid looks like he's about 15 years old. He just started to rap. I thought the kid's metaphors and flows were incredible. As well as digging in the crates, Big L was also involved in a Harlem hip-hop collective called Children of the Corn, with Cameron, Mace, Bloodshed, and McGruff. While growing up in Harlem, Big L also knew Dame Dash, who by then was Jay-Z's manager. Dame organized a battle between the two where Jay-Z drove up to Harlem to battle with them. Dame Dash recalled this moment and said, The most legendary stuff was the battle with Big L and Jay-Z. They had a straight-up battle on 139th Street. We walked over there and it happened. I thought Jay did well because 139th Street didn't boot him off the block. It was like a tie, but he was really on Big L's block. No footage of this battle exists. However, there is footage from the Stretch Armstrong and Bobby Doe show where in February of 1995, Jay-Z and Big L freestyled together. In this footage, Big L is overshadowing or at the very least holding his own with Jay-Z. It's unclear exactly what year this happened, but when Big L performed at the Apollo Theater in Harlem, Nas was in the audience. In an interview with Hot 97, Nas said, I remember it like it was yesterday. He scared me to death. And later, when he heard Big L on record, he thought, yo, it's no way I can compete if this is what I gotta compete with. 
In March of 1995, Big L released his debut album, Lifestyles of the Poor and Dangerous. And despite being roughly on the same caliber as Jay and being the envy and awe of Nas, the album didn't do well. The album debuted at number 149 on the Billboard 200 and number 22 on the top R&B and hip hop albums charts. Faith Newman, a former A&R at Columbia, claimed that Big L was overshadowed by the hype surrounding other artists. According to her, I honestly think, and this is going to sound really effed up, but he just got lost in Illmatic mania and Nas mania. He got overshadowed by the Fugees too. Maybe he didn't have anybody necessarily to champion him at the label, you know? Her had left, and a year later he was dropped by Columbia. According to Big L, I was there with a bunch of strangers that didn't really know my music. Despite getting dropped from his label, Big L still made a comfortable living as an artist. In fact, as an independent artist, he could arguably make more cash up front. According to Lord Finesse, people don't understand, there was a lot of money to be made independent that you wasn't getting in royalties. For every 5,000 singles, you make a $9,000 profit. So if we're doing 30,000, 40,000 singles, 9 times 8, that's 72,000. You ain't seeing 72,000 off no label. So we all got into the independent thing hard body. That was real money compared to this false imagery of money that the label supposedly had. In 1997, he worked on his next album, The Big Picture. And in 1998, he released one of his most iconic songs, Ebonics. The Source magazine said it was one of the top five independent singles of the year. And it also caught the ear of his old friend, Dane Dash. By this time, Dash wanted to sign him for his new label, Rockefeller Records. But Big L didn't want to sign individually. He wanted his crew to sign. On February 8, 1999, it was agreed that Rockefeller Records would sign a group called The Wolfpack, which consisted of Big L, Herb McGruff, C-Town, and Jay-Z. But seven days later, these plans would end up in tatters. On 45 West 139th Street in Harlem, a car drove by and Big L was shot nine times in the face. Three months shy of his 25th birthday, and on the cusp of starting a supergroup with Jay-Z, Big L's life was horrifically cut short. Big L's producer, Ron Brown, said, It felt like Harlem was still for a minute. It just felt like Harlem died for a minute. Adding an extra layer of tragedy to the mix was the alleged killer. Gerard Woodley, one of Big L's childhood friends, was arrested. And NYPD said, It's a good possibility it was retaliation for something Big L's brother did or Woodley believed he had done. The theory was that Big L's brother Lee was in prison, so it was impossible for Woodley to get revenge on him. So instead, he went for one of his family members. However, due to a lack of evidence, Woodley was released. In August 2000, Big L's second album, The Big Picture, was released. Its feature list demonstrated the level of credibility Big L had, with features from Fat Joe, Guru of Gangstar, Cool G Rap, and Big Daddy Kane. This reached number 13 on the Billboard 200 and number 2 on the R&B and Hip Hop albums. Its success supported the argument that Big L was set for much more in his career. With Rockefeller, Big L would have had a label that was run by people he knew and trusted and believed in them. He had pioneered the hip-hop genre of horrorcore and in the same month that he died, Eminem released the Slim Shady LP, which brought horrorcore into the mainstream. As well as Eminem, DMX released the horrorcore-themed It's Dark and Hell is Hot album a year earlier. Lord Finesse said, Eminem was just touching the scene when L got killed and L was still growing. He's adaptable, so he would adapt to the environment. If it was more dope people around him, it was going to push him to be more dope. He's one of the greatest. I put him up there with Big. I put him up there with Pun. I definitely put him up there with them in a heartbeat. As the years went on, Big L's death posed two questions. How good would he have become? And secondly, we still didn't know who killed him. In 2016, yet another person was tragically gunned down on 139th Street. The victim was Gerard Woodley. An anonymous source told DNA Info that Woodley did a lot of bad things and someone decided it was time to go. Police also said that he feared his alleged misdeeds would eventually catch up to him. But linking those comments with Big L might be too much of a stretch. This was 17 years after Big L was shot, and Woodley was a suspect in four other homicides. According to Complex, investigators believe Woodley's death isn't tied to the murder of Big L, claiming anyone had plenty of opportunities to avenge Big L in the 20 years since the incident happened. Tupac's alleged killer Orlando Anderson was killed two years after the death of Tupac. If this was in retaliation for Big L's death, they sure waited a long time to get their revenge. An anonymous source told Complex that Big L was part of a gang that robbed drug dealers, saying, Police believed the rapper would double-cross people he knew by letting the robbery crew 
know the location of cash-carrying drug dealers primed for a stick-up. But the biggest thing that didn't add up was when Cameron, a friend of Big L, turned up to his alleged killer's funeral. Cameron wasn't secretive about this in any way and posted on social media, me and Kev at G-Love Funeral, RIP 139th Street, and posted, another day, another funeral. He also shared a photo of Woodley and L and wrote, all born on 139th Street, all died on 139th Street. SMH, damn, RIP. A short time later, Camon released a clip of a new song he was working on, and the lyrics on this were incredibly revealing. He would rap, grew up with Big L and the dude who supposedly killed him. A week before that, though, Big L had tried to kill him. What was he to do? Please don't get in your feelings. When the time's right, I'll tell you about these villains. Now everybody dead, so it ain't about squilling. Today, Big L rightfully enjoys a cult following in hip-hop and has re received pretty much universal praise from rappers who came up in the 90s. Rappers from the 2010s like Mac Miller and ASAP Rocky, who's also from Harlem, have spoken highly of him as well. Jadakiss on the Drink Champs podcast said that most of his praise came from after he passed away, and the sad reality is that he wasn't appreciated enough in his own time. According to Jadakiss, I don't like that he gave him his flowers after he was dead, right? They should have gave him him when he was here. Make sure to subscribe for more.